support this and maybe disappoint those who believed otherwise. What sometimes happens is, is that each of the people that have to give approvals start to assume that there's that all of the other approvals were done with regularity and mm -hmm. presumed to correctly. be done correctly. Yeah. And that's not necessarily the case. And so uh, in this particular case, you know, what, uh, what was brought to the court was that uh, the approval was done to allow there to be some grading within the phase nine uh, area, a small, smaller portion. How big a lot is that? Is that like 50 or 60 acres? 60 or so acres. Mm -hmm. And so within that, there was approval for grading of eight acres within a specific uh, height limitation, which actually by the, the terms of the schematics that were provided for approval exceeded that. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that came out but, but, but nobody even noticed it but nobody noticed it because as I said there's this presumption of regularity and correctness and sometimes that starts to bleed over to the applicants submissions even though it hasn't been necessarily reviewed by anybody and in any event so a grading permit was issued and part of the grading permit required uh, an archaeological monitoring plan based on uh, what was supposed to have occurred was some kind of archaeological work first to determine if and if and where the burials were. The problem with uh, our grading ordinance in Maui County is that in order to get a grading permit to do the archaeological work, you have to have the archaeological work already done. And so that's a problem. So what ends up happening is the archaeologist says, well, I could only do what the law would allow me to do. And then the state says, well, you know, we don't have any control over the grading ordinance, so that's the best they can do. They approve it. An archaeological monitoring plan is presented based on that very limited uh, review. And so under so, normal circumstances, what would happen at that point is then construction or development would occur based on with a, it following the archaeological monitoring plan. And what happens very often is in the process of grading, burials are discovered that would have been discovered very likely or would have been identified very much so if the proper and correct amount of archaeological work had been done in the first place. So that's under the normal scenario. In phase nine, what was happening was they were not following the archaeological monitoring plan. And so they were engaging in earth, they were using earth moving equipment and did not have archaeological monitors. And in the testimony of the um, man who was operating the heavy equipment, he said under oath, under his own attorney's questioning, that he couldn't see what he was digging up and that there was no monitor. And present. there was nobody like outside observing what it was digging it, up, which, there was which was what a monitor nobody, was supposed to do. There was nobody other than him there yeah. by himself. So, Mayweather and, and Oilani, I, I was going to let them run the film and let the, our audio, I mean, can you run that f second film clip and we'll just keep talking? Uh, do you want to show the before slides first? Those are quick. What, what, why don't we show the three slides first, the before and the after? So we have a, a little a little sense of uh, of how this looked, and and then run the second uh, film because Noe Lenny can uh, can comment on that. Mm -hmm. Can we pull up? Yes. Yeah. So this is this is phase nine before well, that green area around the reservoir. This is 2008. <coughs> well, it had uh, natural dunes and had been bulldozed. <coughs> and then the next picture is phase nine after. Our next slide, please. Wow, what a difference. And then uh, we have a third slide before we get into the video of some of the folks who uh, came out um, for the court case. And those are the burials on top, by the way. That's I a burial see. preserve. Right, right on the top. The fence. Yeah, so they dug everything around mm -hmm. the, the poor little bones. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, so our last slide before the video is uh, of uh, Malama Kakani Lua um, supporters in their t-shirts outside the courthouse. Can we have our last slide? There we go. There's a, there's a handsome fellow at the beginning there. And uh, can you explain a little bit, any of you, about what was happening that day in court? So it, what happened was... Um, when, you know, part of the problem of filing suits like this is that we have to have all the documentation from the State Historic Preservation Division. The problem is, is that the state has chronically underfunded 
um, that division, and so getting records from them takes some time. But when we got the records, we filed uh, a case uh, in, in the environmental court, because the environmental court has jurisdiction over historic, um, his, historic properties, mm -hmm. uh, including burials, and we asked for a temporary injunction, and it was granted. And when it's granted, the court is required to have a hearing within 10 days um, to give the other side an opportunity to contest them. It was very similar to a TRO in a, in, you know, when, when, domestic when case in a domestic or case yeah. where the judge feels like enough evidence has been shown, will grant it, and then they have a hearing some shortly thereafter mm -hmm. where the other side can present their, their side. So that occurred. And uh, so that hearing occurred about a week later, and the attorney for Maui Lani Partners asked for an evidentiary hearing, basically saying all of the documents and all of the affidavits that we had provided, he wants to be able to cross-examine our witnesses and put on his own witnesses, and he wants to have it live in front of the judge, not submitting it based purely on paper. And so that ended up taking six weeks. Um, and Judge Cardoza basically gave us every free moment he had on days when he didn't have criminal trials. And, and so there were days where we were going from morning to afternoon. Um, and some days it was only half day because he only, it's a very busy calendar. Uh, but after six weeks, so this picture was um, after six weeks of that, uh, he had heard all of the evidence and, and the parties rested. And then he made his decision that he felt that um, that uh, violations of the archaeological, mo the approved archaeological monitoring plan, which is itself very weak, but even that very weak document that had been approved uh, had been violated, and that there was a, a, a high risk. high risk of desecration to burials. Um, and so he enjoyed Ma enjoined Maui Lani partners from um, engaging in any kind of uh, development uh, using uh, uh, earth moving equipment um, without all of, in addition to being required to follow the archeological monitoring plan, there were a bunch of additional conditions that further limited the ability of the developer to. So that kind of shut work. down the development for a period of time? That shut down the development for a period of time along with the fact that the county, separately from the burial issue, um, had sent them a notice of warning concerning the fact that um, it, it had appeared that their grading, which was in a residential zone, was went beyond the scope of just grading but was actually resource extraction which sand is mining. which sand mining which yeah. is an industrial use and is yeah. basically never allowed in a residential zone so that's a good lead in to your video right because your video shows the sand mining so if we could pull up no, I mean, it's not really it's not so much the sand mining this video actually shows the, oh, the, um, the evidence of them moving sand without a right. monitor right. okay so if we could uh see the our, la our second and last video then uh, it helps us understand like what goes on. Now someone's narrating here, but I. Well, there's somebody else. Um, there's two of us filming, so you, can, you hear the other. Um, that's Uncle Connie Roa mm -hmm. on his own video. Okay, so what are we seeing here? So this is, um, yeah, this is. Um, an operator on a piece of what's termed earth moving equipment and as Lance said in the monitoring plan it requires um, at least one archaeological monitor per piece of earth moving equipment so that piece of equipment is moving earth and there's no monitor anywhere around the only other people there were myself and Uncle Kanuloa were videoing there was no monitor to be found well and the the operator, the operator. under oath also agreed that there were no archaeological monitors hiding in the bushes and that he, and that he couldn't see and that he, and he but that was actually he wouldn't answer my questions under oath but when his attorney asked him he came out and just said i can't see what i'm what i'm pushing around scooping up anything i can't see anything and uh was this video introduced as evidence as part of your it was. case it was. so so basically it was a he said she said until mm -hmm. you had the video and you said right. well here's what the camera sees Exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. And um, 
what else is there, is there other things in the video that you think would be helpful for our audience to understand so many things um this was i believe was done after um so what had happened was the county sent a notice that they they were in violation um a zoning violation that they were um, doing resource extraction and they sent it on like let's say a Thursday or a Friday and supposedly Maui Lani partners never received that notification however that day and the next day they took out truckloads of sand and um, some folks from Alama Kakani Lua were there on site and videotaped them taking out truckload after truckload after truckload of sand and they followed them um, and the sand was taken to the barge and put on a barge to be shipped to Oahu. Um, and as I think it was Gina Mangieri on KHON2 did a story about it, um, that sand is being used for the rail, to make cement for the rail. Oh, I see. So they took out so much sand. And then I think it was maybe Monday when um, they received this, the second notice. And then they went, oh, here, we got the notice now. But they had already taken out all that sand um, over the weekend. So... Um, they, as Lance mentioned earlier, they took out more sand than they were even allowed to from their grading permit, and they destabilized that um, pool on a, um, and the so, one that we saw in the yeah. earlier videos. That so they had to do some work to repair some of the damage that they did. The county inspectors came out and said it has to be repaired. So I believe the work that that day was, at least that's what they said, was was work that was involving. Um, Restabilizing, yeah, trying right. to fix the violation. Yeah, fixing the violation fixing the da the da of the, the damage. damage. <coughs> so yeah. has it been your experience that there are some archaeologists that are capable of finding, uh, locating more burials, and then others just seem to miss them all the time? Yes. As a matter of fact, um, there are some archaeologists who almost never find anything in a survey archaeology um, study and um, anymore yeah <laughs> yeah and and um this is one of the things that uh barker ferris who was for a short time the archaeologist at the state historic preservation department said no no from now on i will tell you where you will dig your test pits oh so and i will tell you how many mm -hmm. of them you will dig so that you can do a real survey mm -hmm. And so I'm so sad to hear it say that he's no longer here in Hawaii. He's returned back to um, the, the states. And um, basically, is the problem the design of these investigations? Like um, they, they dig a certain number of um, uh, trenches or holes, and then they can conclude, like, no, we didn't see anything. There's no problem, so we could just bring in a larger bulldozer and bulldoze this whole area down? Is that is that how the surveys go? Well, there's no industry standard. So, and as Lance mentioned before, um, they can only do so much work without a permit in order to, to do their archaeology, which is a problem. But even the work that they do do, there's no industry standard. So they can, basically the way the um, archaeological inventory survey works is they will do whatever amount of um, digs they decide to do. And if they find EV, then they consider that um, a previously known burial, mm -hmm. and it gets cataloged as such. And so anything that they find after that point is considered an inadvertent find, and it doesn't have the same protections under the law that a, a previously known burial has. But the problem is that all of the archaeology states that there's a very high likelihood of finding burials and that this is a very well-known burial area. So they, they already know going in that there are burials, but oftentimes what will happen, and keep in mind that um, the archaeologists, these are not state archaeologists, these are archaeologists who are paid by the developer mm -hmm. who have their own, their own the in, interests. Um, and so sometimes it's in their interest not to find burials, and oftentimes the TMKs will re be redesigned or in some cases, 
there will be a burial preserve inside of its so TMK. So you say TMK, oh, that's the that, tax map key. That's so that's like the shape, the meets and bounds, the borders, yeah. of, the boundaries of of a property. So as as you look through over the over the course of years, like what Auntie's been doing, you'll see that oh, this land used to be this TMK, but then it was changed to this TMK, and they keep changing the boundaries. And sometimes they go around where they know there are their burial preserves. It's kind of like cheating so that they don't yeah. have to claim those. Yeah. So it looks like. I guess what they're trying to do is make it look like there's really nothing there mm -hmm. so they can keep going. And it happens over and over and over and over. So if you look at, at old maps, mm -hmm. you can see most of the time in the AIS there are very few burials found, but then um, the, you know, AIS is the, the archaeological inventory, inventory survey. survey, right? But then years later, um, oftentimes they're, they're, they're supposed to turn in reports, the archaeologists, but they generally don't in this particular area, this particular archaeologist working there. But when she did just recently turn one in because she was required by Barker Ferris to do such, there were 169 burial features in yeah. this one increment. And, and in the AIS, I think there was only five. five? Yeah. So, so everything happened after the supposed thorough in investigation right. of the archaeological properties. Even there. though they know that they're in a known burial area. So is this kind of like a polite fiction? Like, uh, well, we're just going to pretend these aren't burial areas and, and, and we're so surprised that now there's some burials? <laughs> you, you could sum it up uh, very well as that uh, just like, I want to build or I want to sand mine and clear this lot. So let's see if Hi can configure the lot so that it'll be clean, there'll be nothing there, and we can say that although we know we're going to find burials, there are no burials that we know of right now. So let's ha get a permit, and SHPD will probably say, okay, well, be very careful, and this is your mitigation. You're going to do an archaeological monitoring plan and part of that you're going to have a monitor there to look out for the burials and any cultural features you may find and you're going to put up buffer zones and you're going to um, stop work and call the police and follow the state law and these are things that although they're so weak they don't get done so it's like um, let's pretend we're going to really protect these burials and follow our trust agreement to protect the people and the p culture that was here. And we'll just pretend that that's happening. So I, I know this is something that brings a lot of sadness to Absolutely. Native Hawaiians because it, it's kind of like a slap in the face, like, well, your dead don't count, you know. <laughs> our dead count, your dead don't count. Um, what? What do you feel, um, I'd like to move to the settlement, what happened in the settlement and, and what do you feel um, that it, what do you feel you can build on from, from what happened in the settlement? Listen, could I just add one thing to what sure. Claire had to say and, you know, um, I, I want to just take the viewers just for a moment back to 2007 mm. and then 2006 and people were getting home mortgages and either the mortgage broker or the real estate agent or somebody would call up and hire an appraiser and it almost happened always that the appraisal praised value always was exactly what the bank needed it to be in order to give the loan mm -hmm. and so it's not saying that every appraiser was a bad appraiser most of them did their job correctly but there was enough of that going around that it caused prices in general to inflate and it also created situations where people were being given mortgages that were way beyond what the, the, the actual value of the home was. And so what was the net result of that? Well, so, as soon as there was a little instability in the in the market, it caused a, yeah. a bubble to collapse. The house of cards. And so what did, the, what did the Federal Reserve do? The Federal Reserve changed the rules. So if you want to get an appraisal for a home mortgage, you have to request it from a central um, system and a list of qualified independent appraisers are on this list and they are randomly selected by a computer and the appraiser is sent you make the, the request is made and the appraiser is sent to you you don't get to pay the the link you still pay the appraiser but the link is no longer there like if you don't do good for my clients you're not going to get any more business that link has been severed 
And so that's one of the ways, theoretically, that it prevents this inflation of values from occurring from the bad apples, and it tries to minimize or limit the bad apples. In the case of archaeological work, the problem is the opposite. Instead of inflating the number of burials, what ends up happening is, is there's this depression in the correct uh, observation or becoming aware of it, burials. It, it diminishes it, the it, amount. It diminishes right? the, the yeah. amount, and that's the, and so the problem, and the problem is, is that the rules allow the people who are going to benefit from the <laughs> results of the work to be entirely in control of that, the, the most critical part of the re regulatory system, which is the baseline data for all of what's required to come after it. And so just like the Fed tried to eliminate this issue of uh, inflationary values, Shipti and the state need to get with that program and they need to change their rules. This doesn't require a change in state law. It only requires a rule change with the land board. But they need to change their rules to break that link because what ends up happening is a lot of folks who are qualified to do archaeological work can't make a living doing it. And so what ends up happening are, and this is not saying that every archaeologist is his way, but there's enough of them that what happens is, is the landowners know who to pick to get the results that they want. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so there's a, the, the ability for people who are qualified to do the work that would do it honestly and would follow uh, generally recognized methods uh, and so forth can't enter into the market of archaeological they, they, they work. They are not the uh, they are not the consultant of choice. <clears throat> that's right. Land and so that's yeah. that is a that is a serious problem. That until that's fixed, I mean, this right. is going to be playing cat and mouse all the time because until that is fixed, those those fundamental issues with how the state regulates archaeological work and how they obtain the data that they they themselves use to determine what needs to be done until that's fixed. It's going to be a, a, a chronic festering wound uh, on state government. Well, thank, thank you. Me. Thank you for explaining that. That was very, I think, useful for people to sort of understand the system because people may be scratching their heads and going, but I don't understand. Why don't they just, you know, find the burials and avoid them, you know, but it doesn't work that way. So uh, we're down to our last, well, I don't know, not very many minutes, uh, six, seven minutes. Uh, so can we talk about the settlement and... Um, what it is, what it ain't, uh, and uh, what happens next. Sure. So the the, the parties uh, in the case um, were ordered into uh, a, basically a court supervised um, settlement conference or, or mediation. So that was Malama Kakani Lua. Malama Kakani Lua, Maui Lani Partners. Mm -hmm. um, the the mediator was um, Antonio Piazza, who's. Uh, really a world renowned mm -hmm. yeah, uh, very very well known leader, mediator well known he's like considered to be the, the father of the American Bar Association's alternative dispute resolution um, division and so he and Judge Cardoza who's the judge in, in, in the case uh, basically served as joint mediators and it was a day long mediation we were there until after court hours broke, broke the rules and ended up having to go down the Judge, the, the judge slash prisoner <laughs> elevator. <laughs> You're either super special or super not to get to go in that elevator, and we were there after. Uh, in, in any event, and so it was a very long all-day process, um, and, uh, and... And Claire and Noelani were there, and... And, 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 and Kamilo, 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 yeah. Kamilo, yeah. Um, uh, and the the end result were were basic terms that are still in the process of being reduced to writing, but the, the terms themselves were put on the record. So it's not like the, the parties can't change the what has been said. That it's, but the basic is is that the terms of the injunction will continue. Um, so when the judge granted an injunction, uh, there were some things that were part of it that that were going to go away when the injunction went away but now they won't that's right so uh, the injunction was preliminary and so that meant that the at the end of the court case the judge would have to decide you know would the injunction continue and under what terms or not uh, and that's the most that could have occurred out of the lawsuit was basically the injunction that was got was changing it from preliminary to permanent mm -hmm. and with the agreement that is in essence that will continue and, and what kind of things were, were part of that? So, uh, in addition to actually having to follow the archaeological... So, I think people don't, people don't understand this. With the archaeological monitoring plan, 
if there's no injunction and somebody violates it, then that means you go to the State Historic Preservation Division, which is woefully underfunded and understaffed, um, and you have to hope that somebody has time to investigate something, but of course in this case they didn't, right? It went on for months and, and nothing occurred. So if there's a violation, you hope something happens, but if it doesn't, it doesn't. If you have an injunction and you violate, so the injunction says you, the court is ordering you to follow the archeological monitoring plan. If you violate the archeological monitoring plan, you're not just violating it, you're also violating the court order. You're in contempt of court. And that's much more, I mean, it, it has more significance more to it. More yeah. teeth to it, because you can be immediately be fined, summarily be fined, or you, someone could end up being in jail for criminal contempt of court. Whereas if you violate the archaeological monitoring plan, it's this whole convoluted bureaucratic thing, and then many times nothing, can, nothing results from it. So that's the importance of have, just having the injunction ordering them to follow what they're already required to so follow. So it sounds like one thing.